Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Sandra Boyson is a research professor and founding co-director of the Supply Chain Management Center at the University of Maryland Robert H. Smith School of Business. He has also served as a principal investigator and senior advisor in supply chain risk management to NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and as a U.S. Secretary of Commerce appointed member of the Advisory Committee on Supply Chain Competitiveness. Finally, he has advised corporations such as Microsoft and SAIC and governments, including Puerto Rico and Thailand, on issues related to supply chain competitiveness. I'll now turn it over to Professor Boyson. Thank you so much, Allison. I appreciate that. And thanks to Chris Thompson and her team for uh, organizing today's webinar. Uh, it's a very timely moment, obviously, a very serious moment in the life of our nation. And we appreciate you taking the time out as participants from your daily struggles to cope with this uh, coronavirus outbreak to join uh, our webinar today. What I'd like to do is briefly share with you some of the research findings that we have uh, had uh, over a period of about two decades in monitoring uh, outbreaks and how organizations are trying to deal with them. And what we have discovered is that the organizations that are trying to effectively manage pandemic risks in their supply chain, and I'm referring to both public and private organizations, have to deal with two significant management challenges. The first management challenge is that supply chains are global pathways for business volatility. And we have seen this um, back in 2008 in the financial crisis, where your supply chain is a very risky business ecosystem. And it includes not only the usual suspects, suppliers and distributors and contract manufacturers, but also less visible actors like corporate banks that provide trade finance to major corporations or regulators, as we're starting to see with the FDA and the medical supply chain responding to the coronavirus crisis. So this, this set of actors in these networks of supply chains are particularly sensitive to very strong or sharp swings in business risk. The very interconnectedness of these systems magnifies volatility and creates, if you will, nerve pathways that act as carrier branches that distribute volatility from one part of the globe to another in almost real time. And we saw this very clearly in 2008, the carrier branch effect, as we call it. The demand slowdown in the United States, the collapse of demand in 2008, rapidly spread volatility over to um, Asia. And what we began to see was a pileup of ships, transport uh, fleets with unwanted goods parked off the coast of Singapore, 50% of world trade goes through Singapore. And as demand collapsed, these ships with unwanted goods piled up and their numbers were equivalent to the entire British and American navies combined. And we know that the tonnage was far greater. So we saw very quickly how this played out overall. And if you look at a chart comparing the Great Depression and the financial crisis of 2008, you see that these supply chains, we believe, contributed with their interconnectedness to a very sharp drop in the volume of world trade. In fact, nine months into the financial crisis of 2008 was equivalent to about 27 months, if you look here, on the blue line, which indicates the Great Depression. So it was steeper, the drop in world trade, than it was during the Great Depression. And we think it was a result of the interconnectedness of supply chains. Now, like the financial crisis in 2008, the coronavirus is triggering massively cascading, we call it massively cascading supply chain disruptions. Let me give you just a few examples. Now, China accounts for about 30% of total container exports in the world. And as a result of the crisis, ship calls to major Chinese ports have fallen about 20%. And as a result, we're seeing major carriers such as Maersk, undergoing very severe financial contractions. We're starting to get reports from all over the United States that trade is being adversely affected by the coronavirus. The port of LA, for example, 
reported volumes of cargo that were down 23% in February um, over the previous year for the same month. Georgia Port Authority on the East Coast is predicting a 40% drop in cargo in March and April. And if you look at the airline industry, probably most dramatically of all, their shares have fallen 25% a quarter since the virus outbreak began. And their industry association, the IATA, did an initial uh, damage estimate, and they, they projected that they would lose about $29.3 billion of revenue. And this prediction was made in February 2020. And only a month later, they revised their loss projections to $63 billion. Now, just to kind of put that into some historical perspective, the entire SARS-related loss of revenue to all of the affected economies in Asia and East and Southeast Asia in 2003 was 60 billion. So just one of our industries is now projecting losses from the coronavirus that would be greater than the entire loss to Asia from the SARS epidemic in 2003. So this is a very serious set of repercussions that's cascading throughout our integrated supply chains as a result of the coronavirus. Now, the second management challenge, and one that is often ignored, is the fact that supply chains themselves are global pathways for virus transmission. And we, we know this um, in a variety of ways. So first of all, we know that being a connected supply chain hub at an international level um, can often put a, a hub or node at great risk of contagion. Um, the Fogarty Center for NIH looked at multi-year data for influenza transmission corridors and determined that major ports, major locations with ports, airports, other supply chain hubs are very much at risk uh, because of the transmission uh, that they facilitate and enable. And the ability, therefore, to disconnect from international supply chains to shut off port airport traffic is absolutely crucial to contain influenza outbreak or coronavirus outbreak at a hub. And we saw this most dramatically, of course, during the SARS epidemic, which I'll refer to a few times here. Um, so cities that had direct flights to Hong Kong were 25 more times likely in Asia to record a SARS case than cities that were not directly connected to Hong Kong. And cities that required two and more connecting flights to reach Hong Kong did not record a single case during the period November to, to July that the epidemic occurred. Now, it's no coincidence, of course, that as we look at the outbreak unfolding here in the US, major supply chain hubs have been the launch points and the epicenters of the coronavirus attack in the US. So New York, Seattle, New Orleans, LA, these have been the epicenters. So supply chain hubs have been important transmitters, not only of business volatility, but also of the outbreak itself. And I think we need to remember that. And disconnecting from global supply chains has, has become a national survival strategy. So we're beginning to see in the last two months, many examples of attempts to disconnect from the global supply chain. Singapore, for example, imposed, has imposed restrictions on flights from 18 high-risk cities in mainland China. And all major ports around the world have implemented 14-day quarantine periods for vessels arriving from or transiting uh, through China. And this is an attempt to kind of slow down that systemic interactivity that supply chains can produce and that can result in both business volatility and the spread of the actual virus itself. Sorry. And when we look at what companies are, are doing to try and deal with the fact that the supply chain has these two major challenges. How have they attempted to overcome these challenges? What have they done? So we have examined a variety of companies, and I'd like to highlight for you very briefly some of the company 
uh, activities that we think represent best in class in both service and manufacturing worldwide. The first uh, example is pandemic planning. Now, pandemic planning is obviously very, very important in terms of readying the infrastructure, the telework infrastructure, the staffing redundancies that are going to be necessary to overcome the very severe impacts uh, on your supply chain. MasterCard and their worldwide uh, operations have developed a pandemic playbook that is widely regarded as best in class. And so what we see is, first of all, that the pandemic planning task force that MasterCard created was uh, very, very plugged in to the highest levels of the organization. There was a huge amount of C-suite engagement. Um, the pandemic planning task force reported both to the CEO and the C-suite executives, as well as to the audit committee of the board of directors. So there's a high degree of executive leadership in this pandemic planning effort. And it also fed into the global um, enterprise risk management program that MasterCard had in an ongoing way. Uh, it addressed the, the unique aspects of what they considered the characteristics of pandemic events, which I'll go into in just one second. They gained uh, very strong levels of management commitment during this process, and they integrated pandemic planning into the whole entire business continuity program of MasterCard worldwide. And the task force that they created mobilized the entire com com uh, company. So you can see here all of the different aspects of the company involved in the task force itself, from communications to corporate security, to global operations, human resources, public affairs, telecommunications, et cetera. Now, this was created, this task force, in 2005. In fact, many such efforts were created in the post-SARS period in corporate America. And a pandemic expert, a scientist, was hired to help develop the plan and to work with this task force to establish a cross-company, cross-functional task force plan and strategy for pandemics. Their worldwide assumptions, which I find very interesting looking at the outbreak today, is 30 to 50% absenteeism of staff, vendors, and providers of community services. And we think that this is a very important distinctive characteristic of pandemics that supply chains have to deal with, and that is the contracting ability of staff and vendors and providers to remain on the job. And this is one of the big dysfunctions that occurs as the pandemic intensifies. In their estimation, the pandemic would last as long as 18 months, three separate waves. And I think that's going to be reflected in the current pandemic as well. We should probably expect a fall and possibly a next spring wave as well. And so companies and particularly MasterCard have prepared for this eventuality. They believe that um, critical functions carried out by contractors or other external service providers will not be guaranteed. They're going to see a lot of force majeure, meaning that a lot of their vendors are going to come back and say, listen, we can't abide by the rules of our contracts with you. We are being prevented by doing so from this fantastically painful disruption we are going through. So they are literally suspending contractual obligations. They also assume that the civil infrastructure will be stressed, but will remain functional. So the telework option, where they created a global infrastructure for telework, the ability to suspend field operations and to rapidly scale both uh, cost and expense minimization efforts to survive have really helped them in the current crisis. As you can see, they started planning for this uh, about 15 years ago. And they just revised their first quarter year over year growth rate to uh, now reflect the fact that they expect first quarter growth in net revenue to be in the low single digits, low single digits. Now, I think this is rather impressive given the intensity of the effects of the pandemic that we're seeing on spending, both business spending and consumer customer spending. This is very impressive. And they expect going forward that their ability to ramp up um, expense, expense minimization will help them to, to respond to the virus situation. 
And what they're doing is very typical of best practice companies. They're going into what we call supply chain hibernation. They're hoarding cash, slowing down operations, reducing their procurements, and suspending field offices in an attempt to withstand, tolerate, and sustain themselves until conditions improve. And I also might add, they're seeing their leadership role in pandemic management as or seem to be seeing it as a long-term branding mechanism. And they just established a, part, a partnership with the Gates Foundation and Wellcome Trust to develop um, drugs in, in, to respond to the outbreak. And it's a $125 million partnership that they, that they did. So MasterCard is a very interesting and important model in upfront planning for um, pandemic and, and, and the value that that planning provides. IBM and their supply chain risk management solution has focused for a long time on pandemics. They run one of the largest and biggest supply chains in, in, in high tech and frankly in any sector. They have 23,000 supplier locations. They operate across 90, 90 um, countries. And it's been clear that in their history of global operations, they have a long experience in managing all kinds of disruptions. Their 1924 logo, in fact, is, is, is of the globe and speaks to the globalization of their operations very early on. And since 2011, they, IBM, has been managing pandemic risk as part of its comprehensive supply chain risk management program. And you can see in their total risk assessment, the pandemic risk entity that they focus on is the supplier sites. They gather a lot of information through their business intelligence uh, software, and they're always looking at um, the readiness uh, of suppliers um, through their pandemic questionnaires. They try to assess the readiness of key supplier sites uh, in order to um, withstand pandemics and become important um, points of maintaining and preserving function during, during an outbreak. So, IBM has done a very good job in planning as well, and it's part of a more comprehensive, larger enterprise risk management and supply chain risk management program. Um, now, in addition to planning and preparing, where the rubber meets the road in a pandemic is in pandemic surveillance and response by a company. And Cisco has long been identified as a leader an effective uh, response to major supply chain disruptions. And I would uh, remind the, the listener that during the great Japanese tsunami of 2011, um, many companies lost 20 to 50% of their production out of Japan, very crucial high tech uh, suppliers uh, that fed the semiconductor and electronics industry. Um, Cisco did not lose a single dollar of revenue because of their uh, planning. They had an alert to the tsunami uh, even before um, the Japanese government did because of the private CIA type organization that they hired called NC4 to give them real time alerts globally. So they had a very early alert about the situation and they were able, able to spring into action with an incident command war room. And they pioneered actually this concept of a war room that can bring together worldwide disruption data that can automatically launch playbooks that have been created prior to events that will activate very specific choreographies, process choreographies among supply chain partners and actors. Now, if you look at their dashboard, and this is lifted from their dashboard in 2008, one of the things that you see is that their predictive analytics that were feeding their war room response actually in 2008 listed pandemics as a relatively uh, likely, but um, not the likeliest risks that they were looking at at this particular moment in time in their war room. So component supply disruption, the Gulf Coast hurricane, the Taiwan earthquake, the Japanese earthquake, all represented in their estimation and in their algorithms that were 
you know, parsing, parsing all of this data, their algorithms told them that pandemics were not of the same level of severity as these other risks at that moment in 2008. They will also then add to the likelihood of the outbreak. They will not only analyze the likelihood of an outbreak, but also the, 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 the severity of the risk as it unfolds. So they would rate the pandemic risk if it was unfolding, for example, as being moderate, severe, extreme, and that would guide a whole separate different set of um, responses based on the assessment of severity of risk. So likelihood and severity and the use of predictive analytics is a feature that Cisco has, has pioneered. Now, the reason that they um, do that and the reason they have pioneered this high degree of surveillance is they have a singular objective, and that is to protect the most critical products that provide 50% of their corporate revenue. So if you look at all of their products that provide 100% of revenue, there's 8,500 products categorized in 200 product families. But if you want to protect 50% of the revenue, you really have to protect 100 of the 8,500 products in the 25 product family. So they can target on this very select portfolio of critical products and to enable them to protect 50% of their revenue as they go through an emergency, okay? Now their virus response has been characterized by its speed. Their ability to sense and respond um, to the event itself as it evolves and to initiate um, risk hedging strategies. So they have an incident management team. I showed you the, the uh, war room for that. They report directly to the executive leadership, to the CEO who considers himself the uh, chief risk officer of Cisco. And they're lever leveraging their global network to aggressively reroute orders that get blocked because there is an outbreak in one area and they're shutting down outbound transportation systems, they're looking for alternative supply, and they're looking to bring up additional manufacturing capability around the world. And one of the ways they expedite that is by ensuring that all of, all of their facilities around the world have duplicate configurations of the production plant. And that makes it very easy to roll over from one plant to another facility in a region that is not as heavily impacted by the pandemic. And so they've identified these alternative sites to move to production to. They've created these new capacities and new locations, and they're collaborating with their suppliers to optimize whatever production capacity is available. Now, Cisco actually spawned or, or launched this sense and response strategy of being able to switch to alternative suppliers or geographies if there is a sudden shift in risk um, to the operations of one very high priority product group. And they're trying to avoid downtime by knowing more earlier about supply chain uh, risk and risk profiles. And their aim is, of course, to sustain continuous operations or business continuity. Now, they were able um, to spin off something that was very interesting, which is a new company called Resilink. Resilink was spun off out of the Cisco supply chain risk management um, unit. The founders were from that unit and they provide a cloud-based service that enables organizations to have visibility over all of their worldwide supply chain sites. As you can see here, for example, in the United Kingdom in this supply chain, there's 37 sites. You can drill down to the sites off this dashboard to look at all kinds of things about your parts, your mitigation strategies, and the impact of events. So if you drill down to not a physical war room, but a virtual war room, what you'll see is uh, a lot of very rapidly assembled, um, reviewed, and highlighted information. So for example, if you go down to the event itself, in this case, identified as E5, it's an earthquake off the coast of Japan. What the Resilink software will do will map the extent of impact of this earthquake, will map the sites that you have, as you see here in the gold circles, 
the number of sites you have as a supply chain manager in that impact zone, how many parts are affected, in this case, 904, how many of those parts are single sourced, meaning they only come from that one site only, and that's almost half of your product or your parts in the impact zone are single source parts, which obviously makes it very risky to you to have such disruption. It tells you the average recovery time of your sites in this impact zone, in this case, 34 weeks, and the revenue impacted by the disruption to your suppliers in this impact zone. So it brings together information that would normally, in the old days, take days or even weeks. It brings it to almost real time uh, in, 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 for the usage of the supply chain risk managers. And it can help you to drill down further to your suppliers and to see, for example, if they have alternative sites and it risk scores them so you know immediately just through visual color coding the risks that each of your partners has and enables you to transfer to less risky partners if you, if you need to. So the last example I would like to talk about in the surveillance aspect is Singapore. And I think it's particularly relevant given the medical supply chain crisis we're currently experiencing in the United States. So Singapore's response to the medical supply chain crisis they faced during the SARS contagion stands as a crowning achievement among public organizations in supply chain response. Now, the vulnerability of Singapore is, is enormous. It's the world's busiest transshipment hub, uh, second largest container port, um, and it's connected in a global network with 600 uh, different ports around the world. Similarly, its airport is connected to 380 cities in 100 countries. That's a lot of connectivity and adds to its vulnerability as a hub location, both in terms of vulnerability to business volatility and disruption and vulnerability to the spread of, and intensification of a viral outbreak as well. And so the global spread of SARS, which was largely focused on Asia in the period pretty much November through um, June, at the, at the peak, they were being overwhelmed. There was a public market where there was a cluster of cases. It was accelerating a mass community outbreak in Singapore. And so the army, the Singaporean army jumped in because there was no ground level coordinating agents, agency, very similar to where we are today in the United States. No single ground level coordinating agency to bring everyone together and to carry out uh, an operation of supplying critical medical supplies to the front line. So within a matter of 48 hours, the Singapore Armed Forces uh, mobilized. They provided a range of uh, functions and activities to support the medical system, uh, everything from contact tracing to quarantine support, to even housing, setting up hotels for doctors so they would quarantine in place, to re logistics resource management and infrastructure support. I particularly want to emphasize their use of net-centric operations. They were world no renowned for that. Our Department of Defense um, did a very careful analysis of their net-centric capabilities in responding to the SARS. And the Army set up a web-based system where all the hospitals um, uploaded to a single website their inventory requirements and the status of their inventory, provided visibility to the Army, who then procured and, and the products that were needed and distributed them directly to the hospitals. So you can see it was a very intense, but very simple web-based system that allowed the hospitals in real time to post to a community need board that would then be responded to directly by the, by the armed forces. This was a very successful model and resulted in the outbreak being limited to 11 weeks in Singapore and limited the economic output, out impacts of the outbreak to about um, four months. Um, so let me stop and conclude by saying that the pandemic supply chain challenge going forward, it can be met. We have, we have seen how best practice organizations can step up and meet these very dramatic pandemic related supply chain challenges. 
But going forward, we have, I think, some very unique challenges, particularly here in the United States. Um, one is for the consumer products industry. How exactly do you account? How do you forecast sensitively and accurately requirements, inventory requirements and production plans and last mile delivery capacities when you have an increasing at-home population? How do you serve such an unprecedented surge of populations that are bound at home? I mean, just yesterday, we increased the lockdown here in Maryland. That's gonna be a major problem going forward. And for the service industry, how do you roll over literally, as we have done in just a matter of days or weeks, a network of physical touch points to service customers to one that's exclusively virtual? And for governments, the main question as we're seeing is, how do you provide critical medical and pharmaceutical products to your front lines and assure adequate feedstocks when China controls so much of the supply. Now, let me give you just one last uh, uh, fact about that. Prior to the virus contagion, China made half the world supply of masks, 20 million units a day of masks. Post coronavirus, they've ramped up to 116 million units a day. So how are we gonna access this since it's the major supply in the world and what trade incentives will be necessary in order to facilitate these critical materials coming out of China and being able to be used in our front lines here in America. So I will stop here, open it up for some questions, but I'd like to show you one last picture that I find particularly relevant. And this is of a pilot who has jumped out of a burning plane. The pilot feels probably a great deal of relief that it was able to survive this, this uh, explosion in the sky. And as the pilot is parachuting forward to this beautiful green emerald island, begins to understand that the shores that he's about to land on are full of alligators and dangers. And I think that's a good metaphor for where we are today. Be vigilant. There are nonstop risks going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Boyson. I am getting some fabulous questions that I'd like to kick off. Um, We'll start with this one. How could the US government today apply to the coronavirus the best practices that Singapore used to manage its SARS pandemic in 2003? I think that's a very good question. Um, and I believe that, and I have, uh, I have stated this actually several times in the last two weeks, I believe that we have a largely invisible player who could play a similar role. And that player is the Defense Logistics Agency it's an organization that is the command center for supply chains in the Department of Defense. They have uh, 37 billion a year in goods and services that they provide. They have large warehouses all over the United States. In fact, their major medical equipment uh, reserve is in Philadelphia, very close to the New York epidemic uh, outbreak. And they have the capability through their global networks to reach around the world to commandeer supplies and they have the ability with their fleets and distribution uh, networks to reach most of, most of the states of the United States. So I think that they are uniquely positioned to play a similar role to the Singapore Armed Forces. Thank you for that question. Okay. If global transport hubs were hotspots of transmission impacting Seattle, New York, LA, Orlando, what has been the impact to other major global cargo hubs, such as Newark, Memphis, Atlanta, et cetera? Well, as, we, as I think we're starting to see in cases like in Georgia, we're starting to see traffic because of the quarantines, because of the, uh, a lot, the really significant amount of inspection going on for uh, any individuals on those ships um, having any kind of uh, coronavirus symptomologies, I think we're starting to see really uh, significant drop-offs in freight to those, to those outlier type of ports like those in Georgia. Um, and I think that's going to continue to spread to the other nodes of the supply chain network emanating from the, our major hubs. Okay, thank you. What are the early signals we can expect to see when supply chains end their supply chain hibernation period? Well, I think we're going to see a significant uh, upshift in inventory, uh, 
stocking in anticipation of a return to normalcy and a return to more normal patterns of, of distribution and consumption. I think that's going to be a very important signal that at least corporations believe that there's a light at the end of the tunnel here. And I believe there will be a light at the end of the tunnel. I think that history has shown us that these disruptions can run anywhere from three to six months uh, following the pandemic. And I think that uh, they will. And I think it'll, it'll be incremental, but I think we're going to see a restocking, a dramatic upshift in purchasing and procurement. And I think we'll see a bulking up of staffing in the physical locations that we normally shop and buy our products in. Okay, very good. What are the most important precautions we can make before the pandemic? Well, I think that one of the major issues that the pandemic um, causes us to have to deal with is staffing concerns. I think when you're, when you're anticipating um, staff absences up to 50%, you really do need to build in redundancy, particularly among critical positions. So you really need to have not only a, um, a lead uh, financial person, but probably a backup financial person as well. I think managing staff absences is a very, very important aspect uh, of this. I think also the, the idea of having what we call um, um, first to buy contracts in place, I think can be very significant. So that means that if there is a disruption, you have the ability to reach into suppliers you don't normally deal with perhaps, but have made arrangements that you will give them a premium if they will reroute inventory to you above what their normal and regular customers are paying. So first to buy contracts have been very successful for companies like Cisco in establishing, if you will, redundant capacity without having to actually pay for them until they actually need that capacity. Okay. So speaking of Cisco, uh, somebody wrote, Cisco is thought of as best in class partly because they have a global network. We see that in the medical supply field, too much manufacturing was sent to one area, APAC. What can we do to encourage manufacturers to spread their manufacturing risk globally? In times of pandemic, when all areas could be hit, what is the best strategy for spreading that out? Well, I think a core strategy that we have seen in response to a whole series of risks, like 911, like the financial crisis, um, has been the regionalization of supply chains. So basically, I think what we're seeing is organizations, global supply chains, establishing regional capabilities. So the end-to-end -end manufacturing will occur within a, one key region to serve that region. And I think that Mexico, of course, has, has served that role, for example, uh, in creating a regional automobile uh, supply chain here in North America. But, you know, there's also a European supply chain for North, for vehicles as well as an Asian supply chain for vehicles. So the regionalization of supply chains will allow, as we go forward in time, to hopefully be able to transfer product, transfer resources within organizations globally from one region that's impacted to another that's less heavily impacted. And that kind of redundancy and failover flexibility is very important for organizations to manage these kinds of crises. Okay, and this brings us to our final question. How do you link a robust corporate pandemic surveillance and response plans to capital, liquidity, and leverage financial planning going forward post-COVID? Very interesting question. And it goes to the fact that many people, many executives have viewed historically um, risk management as being primarily an insurance function. In other words, if I have a a risk like a pandemic that's very high and but it's not frequent and it's not it doesn't come around very often i will typically try to develop insurance uh coverage of of those risks unfortunately we know now as a result of the lack of payment like the lawsuits being brought against insurers that during these kinds of uh, epidemics during these kinds of pandemic responses, insurers will often not pay out enough in business interruption insurance and other insurance 
to cover the costs that those risks are inflicting on organizations. So the ability to provide reserves can be minimized to manage these kind of uninsurable risks through very effective pandemic risk preparedness and response programs. It really helps you minimize the capital reserves that you need to set aside that are not uh, covered by insurance in order to pay for the, the risk damages that are inflicted upon your, you and your supply chain. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Professor Boyson, for your time and sharing your expertise with us this morning. I greatly appreciate it. For everybody, oh, thank, you. thank you. So for participants, I'm Allison Schwarz. I'm the Executive Director of Alumni Relations at Maryland Smith. I'd like to thank you all for joining us as well.